Professor Andrew J. Deeks, President of University College uh, Dublin, Professor Imel Lamar, Dean of the Sutherland School of Law, especially Mrs. Maruha Sutherland and the immediate Sutherland family, both uh, Shane and Natalia, and Ian we're thinking about, um, Mr. Gregory Maniatas, dear friends of Peter and Maruha Sutherland, ladies and gentlemen, your invitation today for me to make these keynote remarks on Peter Sutherland Memorial Day 2019 is one of the highest honors that I have received in a half century as a diplomat and ambassador. There's no one for whom I have greater respect and admiration than Peter Sutherland. He was my strongest supporter and a true friend. And so I'm, I'm privileged to be asked to join you today to commemorate the life and the achievements, the legacy, uh, and the memory of this great Irishman and world figure, Peter Sutherland. And so it is that I am profoundly honored and personally humbled to be with you today. I want to thank University College Dublin, and particularly the Sutherland School of Law, for giving me this unique opportunity I am probably not the most qualified person to be making these remarks, and so I'm all the more honored and humble. So I must confess that I knew Peter Sutherland far less well than most of you. Um, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon introduced us in October 2018 in Manila during the second Global Forum on Migration and Development, which Peter founded. We worked together only nine years but very intensely uh, on a human reality, human mobility, migration. Peter and his lifetime of achievements are legendary. Rugby fame, Ireland's youngest attorney general, the EU's youngest ever commissioner, opening up competition across Europe, especially in telecoms and energy, founding director general of the Global Agreement on Trade and Tariff, which he transitioned into the World Trade Organization, CEO of Goldman Sachs, president of British Petroleum. As businessman, barrister, senior counsel of the Irish Bar, politician and international statesman, and the list of positions he held and the achievements he made could go on and on. And yet still, Peter Sutherland always found time for family. Any one or more of Peter's achievements would have been a distinguished career for anyone else. He was a fighter. Throughout much of his UN mandate, he had bouts of illness. He never let it stop him from the work at hand. I saw him at the Global Forum in Mexico the third or fourth annual iteration of that. He could hardly speak. He kept going. And only, uh, he, he was always in demand and himself sought to be a public service until his death. Only a very short time before he fell fatally ill on September 11, 2016, Peter told me that he was actively exploring and testing the waters to enter the race for Secretary General of the United Nations. Given his wide ranging and rich experience and his international profile, he was very well qualified in my view and would have been an excellent Secretary General. I have no doubt that Peter himself would have said that he succeeded in all of his numerous careers and endeavors only because of his great partner over more than 35 years, his wife, Maruha. And I am profoundly honored and humbled by her presence today, together with uh, members of the family. So I will apologize for this overly long introduction, uh, but I would like to highlight now three points about Peter Sutherland. Uh, from my association with him, brief as it was, points that perhaps show another less well-known 
side of Mr. Sutherland, aspects that I think need to be better known and remembered. First point is he was a humanitarian. You don't always think of CEOs and people in the business world as being humanitarians. First of all, the Peter Sutherland I knew, admired, and with whom I had the privilege of working very closely, was a committed and engaged humanitarian. After all, Peter was a devout Catholic, active in various Catholic and Vatican humanitarian activities, including his recent tenure as president of the International uh, Catholic Migration Commission, ICMC. How many popes did he help? I know that uh, he told me uh, that he was already working, had been asked to work by the Pope on Vatican finances. And I can imagine many other, many other of our Holy Fathers were, were supported by Peter. For more than a decade, he served as the special representative of the UN Secretary General for International Migration, uh, both under the late Kofi Annan and also under Ban Ki-moon. In fact, several years before his appointment for migration, Kofi Annan had asked him to be the High Commissioner for Refugees. Responsible as he was, he turned it down because he said, I've got too much already on my platter to take on more responsibilities, uh, and declined. His achievement, and uh, Gregory of Maniados is with us here, his senior counselor, can tell you in greater detail, but his accomplishments were legion. First of all, he was responsible for the creation of the Global Forum on Migration and Development, GFMD. The significance of that was it's the first time ever that most of the governments of the world have come together annually to look at solutions on how better to manage migration responsibly and humanely. Never happened before. Peter made it happen. We're now in the 10th iteration every year. Uh, the Global Forum was a precursor of everything that followed since then in the field of migration. He helped to foster an environment that allowed the member states of the UN to come together in a declaration that called for migration's inclusion in the post-2015 agenda. In contrast to the stark failure of the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, even to include a reference to migrants and migration. The Sutherland Report came out in, I think, January 2016, an <clears throat> invaluable account of the status, challenges, and prospects in migration. It laid down benchmarks to guide and to measure government's progress on, in the field of migration. Old men get dry throats, sorry. <clears throat> The first ever United Nations General Assembly Summit on Migration in September 2016. It put migration finally and permanently on the agenda of the United Nations. It also celebrated the entry of the International Organization for Migration into the United Nations systems as the first ever United Nations Migration Agency. Think about it. The most important element in the world, people, had never had a focal point within the UN system. Peter made it happen. Two years later in Marrakesh, last December 10, world leaders from 164 nations agreed on a global compact for migration, namely to protect the world's 258 million migrants. That's an underestimate, probably, probably many more. But if you survey Peter Sutherland's work in all the positions he held over his entire career, professional life, it is clear that there is a humanitarian thread that links all of his achievements together. As a businessman, creating opportunities for people, opening up space for people to grow and to realize their dreams, 
at the World Trade Organization, bringing people and nations together around common causes and a shared vision. The President has already mentioned his work as EU Commissioner, bringing together what became the Erasmus program and how much that has helped all of our students to be able to be more flexible where they study. As special representative, of course, advocating for greater immigration around the world into an aging Europe, America, and the OECD countries. So in a very real sense then, Peter Sutherland was one of the fathers of globalization because he focused his efforts in putting in place the missing piece in the globalization mosaic, namely people that had been left out. As the first director general of WTO, of course, he was drawing on his experience. If the World Trade Organization has as a mandate the free flow of capital, goods, and services, what about the free flow of people who make all that happen? Peter understood that. And he, and he made it then an aspect of his own humanitarian role. So first of all, he was a humanitarian. Secondly, this may surprise you, he was a communicator. He knew that to be effective globally as a humanitarian, he had to be able to get his message across compellingly and credibly. He was a great communicator, a masterful communicator. I mean, after all, he's an Irishman, right? Very important. As a special representative, he very quickly established himself as the voice of the voiceless. Migrants have no voice. Migrants are invisible until somebody talks about them constituting an invasion. So he gave them a voice, and his steady stream of articles, editorials, TV, and other public appearances, he became their voice. He became the person to look to if you were a migrant. <clears throat> you all know him well, much better than I. <clears throat> but one thing is sure, he never hesitated to speak his mind. Uh, he did it, uh, even it meant irritating others, as long as he got his message through. They didn't like his message. What he said was, look, <clears throat> given the demographic trends today, Given the series of wars we have going on now, all our societies are going inexorably to become more multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious. Now, it's a message you may not like, but if you don't prepare for it, it's going to go badly. Peter got that message out. You know, I told, I told Peter Sutherland several times, I said, you know, you as a former hard-nosed CEO, you speak with greater credibility on migration than I ever will. You're working for a dollar a year. I'm working for several hundred thousand a year. They, they know that you're speaking from your heart and with conviction, whereas I, as a UN or government bureaucrat, I'm paid to pontificate about migrants' rights. And it's true, he had the credibility. He was a great raconteur, great storyteller. After all, as I say again, he was Irish. He used his Irish sense of humor uh, to get across his point. I remember him telling me once that, he said, you know, Bill, everybody in the world has a few drops of Irish blood. I could only rejoin by saying something I had heard here at, at UCD, that the 40 million Americans of Irish origin consider you, the native population of Ireland, to be what they call FBI, foreign-born Irishman. <laughs> so Peter became Mr. Migration in the public eye and deservedly with great presence and personal authority. Were he among us today, Peter Sutherland would be appalled and outraged, perhaps, but perhaps not surprised, at the continuing spread of populist nationalism, unprecedented anti-migrant sentiment, xenophobia, and the emergence now 
of white supremacy propaganda, leading to the closing of borders to migrants and refugees. He would have been appalled at the dozen armed conflicts and proxy wars that are taking place from the western bulge of Africa to Southeast Asia. He would have been appalled at the lack of political leadership, conviction, courage, and vision. And he would have been appalled at the serious decline in international moral authority. In his own now familiar outspoken matter, uh, matter he would be vociferously denouncing policies that put migrants' lives at risk, deny us their contribution, or that separate parents and children at the border, <coughs> policies that led to 50,000 migrant deaths uh, in the Mediterranean, known deaths over the past decades, a tragedy that continues. In his humanitarian role, he would condemn the widespread, and I can only quote, uh, uh, refugee amnesia in Europe uh, that forgets how Europeans ravaged by the Second World War were taken as refugees to new shores, safe shores and new lives. The amnesia that forgets the 200,000 Hungarians who fled 60 years ago to open arms in Austria and then Yugoslavia and the day shuts Hungary's borders to migrants. He would have been appalled at all that. The heinous attack on the mosques in New Zealand two weeks ago was a horrible manifestation of the religious and racial hatred that Peter Sutherland condemned and warned against publicly. Hatred that portrays others as invaders. He also attacked and exposed publicly the many false stereotypes of people on the move. First one is that migrants steal our jobs. Whereas in fact we know they do what's called the 3D jobs, the dirty, difficult, and dangerous jobs. That's what they do. Uh, and they uh, create jobs themselves rather than taking jobs, especially in the small and medium enterprise economy. <clears throat> he would have attacked the stereotype that migrants are taking advantage of our social welfare systems health, education, whereas a World Bank study recently found that migrants very quickly pay back far more than they receive from social welfare. In a joint editorial in 2014 that Peter and I did, we stated, and I quote, evidence shows that migrants contribute more than they appropriate as they foster knowledge transfers, trade, tourism, investment, and even job creation. He would have attacked the stereotype that migrants create a security risk. There is no record anywhere that any one of the three million refugees who've been brought to the United States since 1980 has ever been involved in anything even approaching a security incident. The lone wolf terrorist attacks that have occurred, Paris, Brussels, Nice, Barcelona, San Bernardino, California, and Orlando, Florida, have all been done by native sons and daughters, mostly sons, not migrants. He didn't make himself popular with this outspoken condemnation of anti-migrant sentiment policies, but you know Peter so well that he was never concerned about being popular, but rather about doing the right thing. People listened to Peter Sutherland, the communicator, because he was a good communicator and because he was passionate about his message. I'm coming to the end, sorry. Third point, he was a strategist. He was a strategic thinker. And that's what it really boils down to in the end. Besides being a compelling humanitarian communicator, he knew that to be most effective, he had to think strategically and be able to design a strategy he demonstrated his ability to get migration onto the world's agenda by means of a carefully calculated strategy. When Gregory and I met the other day in New York, uh, Gregory Maniata sitting here, 
my friend reminded me that when Peter was appointed to be the Secretary General's Special Representative for Migration, migration had not yet emerged as the issue it is today. So initially, Peter Sutherland's strategy was, let me deal with the processes and the institutions that deal with migration. So initially, uh, this led to some criticism, unjustifiable in my view, but that he should focus more on the migrants themselves. Then of course came, came the, what Europe would call the explosion, 1.5 million migrants came across the Mediterranean into Europe, and Europe was all a flutter, and it suddenly became a global issue. Peter would put this in perspective. 1.5 million migrants coming to Europe is less than 1% of the EU's um, population of 550 million. When Angela Merkel said, wir schaffen das, she must have assumed that some of the 27 other UN member states would follow her lead. Sweden did for a while, but then they fell by the wayside. Lebanon alone, with four and a half million people, has one and a half million Syrians on its territory, and a half million Palestinians. So Peter was always providing perspective. And he understood as well as anyone that if migrants were going to be protected and their death toll reduced and their human rights respected, two developments had to occur. Number one, and we mentioned it already, migration had to have a permanent place on the UN General Assembly's agenda. It had to be part of the sustainable development goals and what's called Agenda 2030. In the past, member states of the UN had always managed to keep migration out of the debate, largely for political reasons. And secondly, he said that my organization at the time, I retired several months ago, um, had to become a United Nations agency. He and the current Secretary General, when Mr. Guterres was the High Commissioner for Refugees, they loved to make me squirm at public meetings by always saying, IOM has to come into the UN. I remember that uh, High Commissioner Guterres at the time used to say, uh, we were both, UNHCR and IOM were both born in 1951, but they lost your birth certificate, IOM. Peter, being a good Catholic, would put it differently. He would say, you have been living in sin all these years with the UN. It's time that you get married. So uh, we finally came in. I, I, was, I frankly was very skeptical about going into the UN because I said, we don't want to become bureaucratic. We don't want to become slow. We need to keep our operational ability and agility. But Peter was looking further ahead as a good strategist and said to me, basically, this is the way to go. Um, and I learned a lot from his strategic longer term vision and became a true believer, for which I'll always be grateful to him for. Um, so his strategic initiatives bore fruit at the opening of the session in September 2016, when I signed the agreement with Ban Ki-moon. Uh, and neither that nor the uh, Global Compact would have been conceivable without Peter's strategic vision. Tragically, only days before the meeting on September 16, 2019, uh, he fell ill, and it kept him from witnessing firsthand the fruits of his labor. Let me conclude. So we're gathered here today to honor and to celebrate the life, the legacy, and the legend, if you will, of Ireland's and UCD's, one of, one of, its, one of your greatest sons, Peter Sutherland. And it's so fitting and timely that you named UCD's School of Law, the Southern School of Law, uh, several years before uh, his death. He will always be remembered in the migration field as a giant who led the way. I will always remember him as my strongest supporter in a difficult time trying to push migration and a faithful friend, a companion in arms in a noble fight for the rights of all people on the move. And I can tell you in the future, if migrants' lives 
rights and prospects are better in future years than they are today. If fewer migrants die in the sands of the Sahara and the depths of the Mediterranean, uh, then this will be due largely to Peter Sutherland and his great humanity, his compelling advocacy, and his strategic thinking. So we commemorate the life, the legacy, and the legend of Peter Sutherland, and in so doing, I think we all want to express on our behalf and that of the family and that of migrants and others the world over our eternal gratitude to Peter Sutherland. Thank you.